It's my privilege and honor to introduce Joseph Scow, who is the UCP MLA for Cardston Siksika, and he will be speaking today on the topic, the fiscal outlook for 2023 and a recap of years past. Please join me in welcoming our speaker. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Usually these things aren't made for guys who are six foot nine. It's a, it's a gift and a curse. It, uh, it paid for college, but it's tough finding clothes and anything else making life work. But uh, I'm really honored to be here with you today. And uh, it's a, a real privilege to join you and to give a bit of an update on the fiscal outlook uh, and the recap of years past. Uh, I do have a presentation, as you can see here to my right, uh, to highlight some of the messages I want to share with you today, as well as some of the big ticket items the government will be focusing on in uh, 2023. Now, as we do move through the presentation, uh, if you have any questions, I ask you to write them down or just keep them in your mind, as at the end there will be a question and answer period, as Beth had mentioned. And, uh, and of course, I know the media here, I'm grateful for their, their presence in covering this important event. So over the past few years, this province has faced a number of challenges that are in fact and were in fact out of our control, whether it be a collapse in oil prices down to negative prices or the thing that we won't mention by name. It has all taken its toll on our province and the Alberta workforce. But despite the ongoing inflation uh, increased and driven a lot by out of control spending by Ottawa Liberals and the aggressive interest rate hikes, ongoing geopolitical uncertainty, Alberta will remain positioned very well to weather most economic challenges that will come out most of our way, mostly in part uh, because of the government's prudent fiscal management. As we move closer to the start of the spring session, the budget, budget 2023, will be tabled on February 28th, and it's an opportunity for us to continue Alberta's positive trajectory. This means we'll keep even more of our money, uh, even more money in Alberta's pockets, improve our health care system, and further strengthen the economy, and ensure Albertans and their families feel secure in their homes, in their communities, and at work, and on the road. <clears throat> and so I'm, I'm, so I'm very excited to share with you today, we can work at this a little bit, uh, I'm excited to share with you today important parts of the budget 2023 to keep us on a path towards economic prosperity. Uh, there we go. So the province is at a unique and challenging point in our history. On one hand, we are facing uh, very real prospects of a global downturn and a recession in 2023. On the other hand, Alberta's economy has momentum. And there are many forecasters, including RBC, and the Conference Board of Canada predict that Alberta will lead the country in economic recovery and growth, uh, and not entirely avoid, but definitely dampen some of the, uh, the effects of the recession, unlike most other provinces who are expecting downturns. But let's start with job growth. Alberta is leading Canada in employment growth. That is a fact. Alberta gained almost 94,000 full-time jobs last year, 41,000 of which full-time jobs were added in December alone. In fact, Alberta was responsible for almost one quarter of all of the new jobs created in Canada. Despite what some critics have been saying, Alberta is and will continue to be the best place to live and work in the country. Now here in Southern Alberta, the unemployment rate in Lethbridge, Medicine Hat region has decreased uh, by 5% to date since 2022. We've also seen an increase in the population and labor force of up to 2.8% in the same time frame. Alberta continues to attract people from other jurisdictions and abroad, leading the nation in population growth. Alberta is calling and people are answering the call. Now, Canadians and new immigrants are also taking notice of Alberta's growing economy, lower cost of living, and the, uh, and the abundance of opportunity here in the province. They see we pay less overall taxes, we have no GST, no payroll tax or health care premium, and a low provincial income tax indexed for inflation. 
and Alberta has some of the lowest housing prices and rental costs among major Canadian urban centres, and Alberta workers have the highest average weekly earnings across all the provinces. <coughs> But national and international businesses are also paying attention. With one of the most highly competitive corporate income tax uh, systems in North America, Alberta's economy is rapidly diversifying in sectors such as aviation, technology, finance, and other emerging industries. Here in southern Alberta, some of you have may, may have noticed this economic growth and plenty of good news uh, around the region. For example, Southland Trailer, a trailer manufacturing uh, manufacturer will double its production and create 250 new jobs. The expansion is being made possible in part by Alberta's Investment and Growth Fund, which contributed $2 million to the company's growth plans. PIP International, a Canadian-based agri-food company, just celebrated the opening of a new $20 million pea processing pilot facility in Lethbridge. As well as a second phase, we'll see the construction of a new $150 million pea, yellow pea processing facility later this year. The facility will create 100 new jobs upon its, once it becomes operational. CGC Incorporated is building a manufacturing plant uh, of Wallboard in Wheatland County. I had the privilege of being there at their launch. It's a very exciting time there. This will create 100 permanent jobs and approximately 200 construction jobs. This is a $210 million project that will be finished not so, uh, in, in the not-so-distant future. And aircraft manufacturer de Havilland says it has acquired about 600 hectares of land in the area around Wheatland County. And that construction on a new facility could begin as early as next year with its first buildings operational by 2025. This new facility will support at least 1,500 new high paying jobs when it's completed, as well as numerous construction jobs as is uh, through the process. It will be dubbed the de Havilland Field. It will be located between Chestermere and Strathmore. These are just a few of the major investment projects Southern Alberta uh, is, is having with countless more around the province. And these show that Alberta is constantly growing and expanding. It's great news. The plan for recovery is working. In the first half of 2022 alone, Alberta saw 56 new deals worth $481 million of venture capital investment. And the province's agri-food sector has attracted nearly $1.5 billion in new investment and has created close to 3,000 jobs since 2019. And I'm throwing a lot of numbers at you for a very important reason. The plan is working. People are coming to Alberta and they're investing in the province and investing in Alberta's future. And in 2023, Alberta is forecast to collect the most corporate tax ever. And that income will be put back into our communities through funding infrastructure, health care, and other programs that make Alberta the best place to live and raise a family. <coughs> As we move into spring of 2023 and our budget uh, and, and our budget conversations, Alberta's government is determined to keep this momentum going and to ensure long-term stability and prosperity for Albertans. The key element to budget 2023 is to, be, is to continue to make Alberta the most attractive place to live and to do business and to spur even more investment by private sector job creators. We are looking to see these jobs created in both the agriculture sector, which is so vital to southern Alberta, as many of you know, as well as other sectors as we diversify the economy. What about energy? While we are focused on diversification, we cannot forget the fact that energy is a major driver and powerhouse, not only in Alberta, but for the country of Canada. The energy sector continues to be among the most productive and responsible and highest paid industries in the country. And this industry can be part of the solution to the world energy crisis. Many developing nations still struggle from the existential threat of energy poverty, which is the lack of access to sustainable, modern energy services and products. Inadequate access to safe, sustainable energy usually translates into a lack of opportunity and development in agriculture and manufacturing. In turn, this keeps the poorest countries trapped in a vicious cycle of poverty. Canada offers safe, clean, sustainable energy to the rest of the world, a much better option than energy coming from other countries with deplorable human rights and environmental records.
In short, the world needs more Canada and Alberta energy, and anyone who would suggest otherwise is not being serious. The energy sector is diversifying in its own right as well, driving innovation and growth in many adjacent sectors, clearly showing that it will be, continue to be a foundational part of Alberta's economy and the economy of the nation. We also have people uh, have access to abundance of well-paying jobs. They are generally healthier, they're happier, they're more secure, and they contribute more to their communities. The focus work and our continued success is solidifying Alberta's position as the economic engine of Canada. But we also have challenges that lie ahead. <clears throat> as oil prices have trended down slightly and the inflation crisis stretches, there is no simple solution. Budget 2023 will continue to support families, seniors, vulnerable Albertans, and all Albertans. We must also pay down the provincial debt and build into savings so that our province is better positioned to weather potential future, future global recessions. Simply spending our problems away like the Ottawa Liberals, uh, as they have chosen to do, is not being financially responsible and it's not the answer. None of us want our children and our grandchildren to pay our bills, which is why we're taking steps now to keep that from happening. There are challenges ahead, but we are leaving no one behind. We know the top concerns in the minds of Albertans as we approach a uh, session are affordability and access to health care. We're working hard to address them. We know things have been difficult for our frontline workers and for families struggling to pay bills and to get groceries and get kids to hockey practice and other activities. Alberta's government is already working hard to lend a helping hand and offer support through the rising cost of living. Our government has committed $2.8 billion over the next three years, providing both broad-based support, such as electricity rebates, spending the provincial fuel tax, and targeted relief to seniors, families, and children and people with disabilities. Just last month, we saw Albertans uh, saw the affordability portal launch with more than 1 million Albertans enrolled and scheduled to receive their first of six payments of $100 per month, which represents $96 million of inflation relief and many more getting approved each week. <coughs> The $600 in affordability payments adds to the hundreds of dollars Albertans are receiving and saving under the Affordability Action Plan. This includes an estimated $900 saved by suspending the provincial fuel tax, expanding electricity rebates, increasing benefit payments in core support programs, and pausing private passenger vehicle insurance rates through the end of 2023, something we worked with insurance companies to do. We've also announced new affordability supports for Alberta's post-secondary students. As part of Budget 2023, we plan to cap tuition increases at 2% starting in the 2024-2025 year and onwards, reduce the interest rates on student loans to prime, extend student loan grace period from 6 months to 12 months, something I would have loved when I graduated university, and to increase eligibility for the repayment assistance plan. These measures will ease the impact of inflation so post-secondary students can focus on education and worry less about having to pay back the debt immediately. In addition to these supports, Alberta, the Alberta government has provided added financial support to food banks and other community groups, increasing funding for low-income transit, pass programs, and index the personal income tax rate. Budget 2023 will also continue to transform reform and strengthen the health care system through Alberta's health care action plan. We've heard the cries for help, especially in rural regions, when it comes to EMS service and doctor shortages. Just last week, I spoke to the town council in McGrath and I heard their concerns regarding these issues. In fact, one of the councillors shared a heartbreaking story about a family member who needed to be taken to the hospital. The councillor didn't even bother calling EMS, they just jumped in the truck and went to the hospital. That was the first response, and that was the, end, and that was the, the, uh, the best response that that councillor felt in the moment. These are the kinds of things that we're prioritizing in Budget 2023, is things like EMS response times. But the urgent, the urgent reforms are focused on reducing the wait times in emergency rooms, 
improving EMS response times by getting more ambulances on the road and empowering paramedics in the field to make decisions on the spot. Offering thousands more surgeries in underutilized rural operating rooms and chartered surgical facilities. And restoring decision making to the local level so frontline workers can help shape and provide better care that you need locally. And on that note, I would like to give a thank you to all the frontline workers for all their diligent work. It's uh, sometimes can be a thankless job, and I know many of them. I'm grateful for all they do. Our government is supporting this work with record level of funding to the healthcare system through decisive leadership and AHS to drive changes quickly. And Albertans deserve access to world class, top quality healthcare when they need it, and where they're, we're doing everything we can to make sure that that happens. Now, as we prepare uh, and have our budget discussions uh, and eventually share with you what that budget looks like, we want to focus on three fiscal anchors. The first is a balanced budget. Second is keeping our net debt to GDP ratio below 30%. And the third is bringing our spending per capita in line with other provinces in the country. Our government is using your taxpayer dollars wisely. We respect them and spending it to improve the lives of Albertans and spur economic growth. This means we remain committed to responsible fiscal management moving forward. Continuing that is important and paying down the debt uh, and saving for tomorrow. As I mentioned earlier, it is important to commit resources to better Alberta, but it's just important to take the time to pay down the debt. That is why this year we will be committing a record paying back to the debt of $13.4 billion. The government is saving Alberta millions of dollars in interest payments by doing this and reducing the debt burden on future generations. By keeping $1.2 billion of earnings from last year in the Alberta Heritage Savings and Trust Fund, we're also boosting up this important savings account to help Albertans during inevitable rainy days in the future. And with another $5.8 billion set aside from the provincial surplus next year, the government must decide uh, in budget 2023 how much to save, how much to pay down debt, and how much to spend on the priorities of Albertans, communities, and businesses. Alberta will maintain balance and strength in its finances and not fuel inflation like our Prime Minister and his excessive spending that can't be sustained long term. We must use any future surpluses wisely and benefit our burdens today and for the future. This government will lead the way to prosperity by continuing to follow the three fiscal anchors we did set in 2019, which is first, commit to a balanced budget, ensuring no longer borrowing them from the future generations and relying on them to pay for decisions of today. Second, continue to reduce our debt load and keep Alberta's net debt to GDP under 30%. This means we will be in a great position to pay down debt in the future and work towards being debt free once again, just like Ralph. Third, we are successfully bringing our spending levels in line with other provinces. <clears throat> we can no longer be an outlier on, on, a number of, on a number of our spending. And by keeping our spending in track, we will ensure programs, top quality services are sustainable for our future generations. And that's what this government's focused on for this budget coming up in 2023. And I look forward to seeing great things from our province can achieve, and I hope that you are as well. Now, I want to take a few minutes and talk about the amazing work the government has done in the last couple of years. Again, it's been tough on so many of us, but it's important that we recognize the good. Oftentimes, when you're climbing a mountain, you forget to look back and realize how far you've come instead of looking ahead of how far you have to go. One highlight for me was, was the job creation tax cut in 2020. We reduced Alberta's corporate income tax from 12% to 8%, improving Alberta's competitiveness on an international scale and encouraging businesses to invest and hire in the province. CNRL announced plans to expand its operations in response to the job creation tax cut, increasing its 2020 capital spending by $250 million and creating an estimated 1,000 new full-time jobs. TELUS also announced a $16 billion investment in Alberta, creating an estimated 5,000 uh, 5, jobs and connecting businesses and homes across the province to fiber. 
And finally, one of the biggest highlights for us as a government and for myself was presenting our burdens with a balanced budget in 2022. This was the first balanced budget in nearly a decade and has target modest surpluses for the next three fiscal years. There are many more in, uh, initiatives that we are going to announce and, and have completed in 2019, as I mentioned, including rent relief for Alberta small businesses in 2020, our efforts to support Alberta struggling with addiction, and so many more. And all of these announcements show that this government is working hard to make life better for Albertans, and I'm looking forward to sharing this with you and what that will look like through Budget 23 in the next two, uh, few short weeks. Thank you. We have many thanks. Thanks to the LSEO, Lethbridge Senior Citizen Organization, who have provided this room free of charge. Thank you, each one of you, for patronizing their lunch counter. Thank you to the University of Lethbridge for their ongoing support. Thank you to each of you for buying your membership. Thanks to Shaw TV and Ryan right here and Bridge City TV, who was here before, for recording our sessions. You can watch SOCPA on Shaw Spotlight TV or on SOCPA.ca or on YouTube. And if you go to SOCPA.ca, you just go into archives. Thanks to the Lethbridge Herald for their coverage and support. Next week's speaker will be Kent Peacock on the top topic, Are We Copping Out on Climate? And apparently that's a pun on COP. Okay, we ask those of you waiting to ask questions to line up on the wall where Knut is standing. Please state your name and your question briefly. No long preludes or stories, please. I have to remind myself. We expect respectful and polite discourse. Now, if you prefer to write your question, as <coughs> our speaker was recommended to you, only those that are legibly written and signed will be asked by the moderator, me. OK. I'll ask now for um, our speaker to return to the mic and for the questioners to please line up. Thank you. Fire away. Come up to the mic. Oh, sure. <laughs> Back and forth, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, that's okay. <coughs> Thank you. My name is Henning Mundel, and as you know, you are better than my MLA since we live in Sunset Acres. Yes. But more important for this gathering, you're the government house leader. My question goes back to when you were elected, and we attended several forums. Mm -hmm. You were elected as part of Team Jason Kenney. Mm -hmm. Now you're part of Team Danielle Smith. Move closer to the mic. Now you're part of Team Danielle Smith. And my question to you, maybe sound a little bit tongue in cheek, but as government house leader, I assume you're frequently asked after she makes a statement how you interpret it. But when she goes back the following day, some, says something quite different from what she said the day before, how do you navigate that in relation to the press? Well, I, I don't presume to speak for the Premier, um, and I let her speak for herself. And when I was elected, I was, I was elected by yourself and my constituents. So I'm, I'm Team Cardston Siksik, and I'm Team uh, UCP. So when it comes to comments made by the Premier, I, I let her speak for herself, as I did with the former Premier. And uh, whenever I have concerns that come to me, for my constituents, I make those known to them, and, and they've always been respectful and receptive of those things. So I, I guess to answer your question, I, I don't speak for her. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> Hello, my name is uh, Knut Peterson. I would like to ask you, Joseph, about the uh, money that the government is planning on putting into of cleaning up the abandoned and 
orphan wells in Alberta. Uh, it seems a little disingenuous to pay oil companies that are making record profits right now to clean up what they are supposed to clean up by themselves. Can you uh, talk a little bit about what motivates the government to actually give them money to do that, that this, what they are supposed to do anyway? Well, I think it's a great question and one that actually hits very close to my own constituency because there's a lot of orphan wells uh, in, in Cardston, Six Sika. But uh, no final decisions on this have been made. The reality is we are consulting because a lot of these orphan wells date, you know, predate 1980. And, uh, you know, they've changed hands a number of times in ownership. And so the reality is we as a government have to find a way to get these things cleaned up. But uh, we are still consulting to, to find that way and make it, make it happen because I've spoken to a number of farmers who have orphan wells on their property and they're not receiving any, uh, any compensation from the companies anymore. And this is a real frustration. Uh, you know, I, I don't, clearly back then there wasn't a lot of foresight, and so we're now left with this problem looking for the most effect, effective and efficient way to clean it up so that farmers can continue doing what they do and, uh, and respect the land. So I, I, uh, I, at this moment, we're still consulting. Uh, no dis final decisions have been made on that at all. I'm where this uh, stand out. Uh, thank you for being here. I appreciate your entering into dialogue with us. So uh, that, that's the uh, first thing. I have two questions. Name. First, name. my name, thank you, uh, Terry Shellington. First question, there's an ECA after your name in the flyer, and some of us are curious about what that stands for. Mm -hmm. uh, secondly, uh, but more substantially, Earlier in the four-year mandate, we heard a lot about a provincial police force and a provincial pension plan. And um, I'm curious as to whether that's still uh, on the docket. Uh, is that part of an election campaign, or, or are we, have we heard the last of those two items? Really great question. So the ECA is Executive Council of Alberta. Uh, I got that title after I was made it, put into cabinet as the government house leader. Uh, so that's all that means. And um, with regards to the provincial police force and the pension plan, so new actuarials have come out from uh, CIA, um, uh, the Canada Pension Plan in, in, in Ottawa, and so they're reviewing the numbers and sending those back to get a new report. So when that report is tabled, it will be tabled, but it will be, it's not a part of the campaign or anything like that. In terms of provincial policing, we are dealing with some issues that I'm sure everybody has seen in the news or even maybe experienced, unfortunately, which is an increased crime rate. Uh, we are looking for ways to address that. And so our response right now is we're increasing the presence of sheriffs in Calgary, and they are very w grateful of this, and same with Edmonton. Uh, we're seeing increased pre police presence there, and uh, we're looking to address the issue of, 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 of also rural crime and exploring those options. So in terms of where that's going, um, again, still consulting, trying to get that that process right, but in terms of dealing with the crime issue right now, I'm really grateful for Minister Mike Ellis, the Minister of Public Safety, and him working with uh, Calgary and Edmonton Police Forces, increasing boots on the ground with the sheriffs, and, uh, and it's working. Okay. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Hi, um, I'm Barbie Neely Sears. I just had a question about if you could help us know the differences between um, Jason Kenney's um, budget and financial uh, vision for Alberta and the changes and the differences that have been put in with Danielle Smith's government. Thank you. Well, I'll have to, uh, there, not a lot. The fiscal uh, anchors that we're still relying upon are the same back in 2019 as we do now, which is balancing a budget, bringing debt to GDP ratio under 30%, and bringing that spending per capita in line with other jurisdictions. Um, you know, there, there was a real curveball thrown at us uh, between 2020 and 2022. Uh, to quote one of my favorite athletes, everyone has a plan until you get punched in the face, uh, in which case your plan changes. That's Mike Tyson, he said that. Um, but I uh, shouldn't say favorite athletes, he's very, anyways. Um, but uh, we had a plan, that plan got derailed a bit, but because of prudent fiscal management, as well as uh, you know some help from the energy sector, we were able to get back on track and we've seen budget surpluses uh, last year and uh, looking forward to budget 2023 and the great news that brings.
My name is Jim Moyer. Thanks for your presentation. I just heard that Barclays Bank is no longer going to invest in the oil sands. And this is a trend with, say, all European banks. Canadian Bank may follow suit in a few years. And I thought, well, this is due to be trying to be green, but they say this is due to the fact that they see this is the way the economy is going to go, that in the future oil prices are going to drop, and there's no future in or no. The future for this industry is not bright. So I'm just wondering, are you prepared for this change in the future? Well, I think we always need to be prepared for changes in the future. Uh, I can't speak for Barclays, but what I can speak to is the importance of our natural resources here in Alberta. I, I mentioned early in my remarks about energy security uh, around the world, and there are developing nations or, that, that just don't have that. And they're going to rely upon nations like Canada to, to have access to energy. And if we can't, uh, if we can't get that to them, we're going to see countries that are really failing and stuck in the cycle of poverty. So I think it's very disappointing to hear financial institutions that are choosing to uh, not to invest in energy and uh, in oil and gas. Um, but we have a great product. We have a great story to tell here in Alberta. And we are preparing for a future that is green. But we're also, uh, I see oil companies uh, who are also making changes in the way they operate. We have some of the cleanest and highest ethical standard uh, in, the, in the country, in the world. And it's, uh, it's one we're going to share, it's a story we're going to tell. My name is Laurie Schultz. Joseph, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I'm, my question is in regards to long-term care. So for decades, long-term care across all provinces and under the governance of all political parties of all stripes have essentially failed. So I'm wondering, two questions, um, will the UCP uh, adopt and implement the recent federal guidelines that have come out for long-term care? And does the 2023 budget, um, will it include funding uh, for long-term care? Thanks. Well, in terms of funding for long-term care, this is something that's very close to my heart. Um, you know, having seen, uh, you know, I, I, I no longer have any of my grandparents who are around, but in their final days to me, it was very important that, uh, that they were treated with dignity. And that takes resources sometimes to get the attention that they needed. And so as an MLA and as a minister and just as a, as a citizen, it's really important to me that, that there is adequate funding and support for long-term care. Um, so I know that uh, having spoken as recently as yesterday with the Minister of Seniors and Housing, uh, the importance of that, uh, the resources that need to go to long-term care and even long-term care facilities here in Lethbridge in the, in the Lethbridge County area, we're looking at those and making sure that they adequately support uh, seniors and, uh, and, and they provide that care that they need and frankly, the care that they deserve. Hi, Leona Jacobs. So I'm going to come back to this R star, this liability incentive, something or other plan that you have that hasn't been decided, as you pointed out. That hasn't been decided, as you pointed out. However, my question is this: You've talked about it in terms of the, of cleaning up orphan wells. By definition, orphan wells don't have a company because they've been orphaned. They companies have gone bankrupt and they walked away. So who stands to benefit from this royalty credit business that you're proposing at this point? Who stands to benefit? <coughs> well, again, I would go back to the fact that no decisions have been made on this. Um, so in terms of that, if no decisions have been made, no programs are in place, there would be no benefit of anybody in particular at the moment. Uh, when the final programs and systems are set up to reclaim the wells, then uh, there'll be more to report back on that. But at the moment, that's, that's, uh, no decisions have been made. All right. uh, Ken Sears, um, I was going to ask about uh, coal mining, and maybe you can talk about that 
because there's no decisions being made there either. But what I really want to talk ask you about is municipal funding. At this point in time, the Rural Municipalities Association estimate they're approximately $245 million owed in unpaid taxes by various oil companies to 69 municipalities. Now, just to give you an idea of the impact this has, oh, and I'm sorry if I'm speaking, but I want to get some context here. It costs between 500000 and a million for a municipality to build one kilometer of road or one bridge. So what we have here is a situation where the municipalities, the rural Albertans, are winding up with a huge load that's not being funded by the people who are supposed to fund it, which is the oil companies. Okay. What is the provincial government intending to do about this? It's a very impassioned question. Thank you for that. Um, well, uh, we are working with the municipalities. We've definitely heard their frustrations, and if you are doing business in one of the municipalities, you've got to be paying your taxes. Um, when things were in the downturn, I can understand some of the oil companies having difficult times, but going forward, uh, we need people making sure they're paying their taxes so that the municipalities are being made whole, and they can, so I, we're working with them on that, uh, but in terms of what the government's doing, uh, more to come on that, we are working with the municipalities. Thanks, Joseph. Thank you very much for coming today. I really enjoyed listening to your presentation. Um, we camp a lot in the Crow's Nest. Speaker. Speaker. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. My name is Violet Meekma, and I camp and quad in the Crow's Nest Pass in the summer and love it out there. And I'm wondering if you have any plans for enhancement of tourism in that area or other areas of the province. I think there's great potential, and I think we all know that. And um, I'd like to see some more development in that area. So if you could comment on that, I'm hoping there's something in the budget to maybe assist people in those areas. Thank you. Well, in terms of the budget, I couldn't speak to anything specific. It hasn't been tabled, but Alberta has a beautiful landscape and uh, I, I like to get it and explore as much as I can. Sadly, not a lot of time for that in this job, but uh, I have, uh, I've expressed some of the similar concerns you have and needs uh, to the parliamentary secretary for, for, uh, for tourism, Martin Long and uh, working with colleagues because we need to bring Albertans, uh, sorry, we need to make sure Alberta is a welcoming place for people out of province and out of country. Mm -hmm. And we, uh, again, we have a great story to tell, lots of great things to show, and want to support the tourism in industry. But in terms of specific numbers, I wouldn't be able to share that with you today. All us short people. <laughs> um, thank you, Joseph, for coming. And as you hear the questions, you know that this is a, a, a group that likes to ask tough questions. So thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Mary Shillington, and I'm a retired clinical social worker. And as such, the things that are happening in Calgary and Edmonton in their downtowns um, concern me around uh, homelessness mm -hmm. and addictions. and. Yeah, your government is supporting uh, sending in sort of police with the sheriffs. Uh, I'd like to hear what the plans are around homelessness and addiction issues that are really current there, and we're having them here too. So uh, if you could express some, some uh, opinions and programs or plans or whatever, I'd like to hear them. Thank you. Certainly. Thank you for that question. You know, we are not immune here or anywhere else in the province to seeing the effects of addiction and substance abuse. And the reality is, as a government, we're taking a recovery-oriented strategy. Um, there is, uh, as some have seen, the, the devastations of the harm reduction program that was here in the city, and uh, it did not work. And frankly, uh, as, a, as a government, we need to deal with this in a very holistic approach and addressing mental health, addictions, and making sure people can get off, the, get out of the cycle of addiction and uh, get them into recovery and treatment. I think that will deal with a lot of the homelessness problem. Um, 
And so that we are very committed to that, and I'm grateful for Minister Mike Ellis, the Minister of Public Safety, who was uh, the one who worked on this program prior as the Minister of Mental Health and Addictions, and now Minister Nick Milliken is working on it, addressing not just the crime, but addressing some of the root problems of the crime, which is addiction and poverty and homelessness. And uh, it's, it's, it's not an easy task, but it's super, but it's just so important because um, when you're talking with someone who is stuck in the cycle of addiction, they need help. They don't just need a needle. And I really believe strongly that our government is committed to helping people get off that cycle through a recovery-oriented strategy. Hi, Barb Phillips. Thank you for coming to SACPAW. Uh, my question, first of all, it goes back to our star, and I think we should maybe clarify a little bit more clearly that orphan wells are entirely different than abandoned wells. This current liability incentive, whatever the name of it is, is targeted to abandoned wells. So there are owners of those abandoned wells. They just have not seen fit to pay their taxes or the rent to the farmer. Getting on to that, though, I noted in your speech that you not once named our former Premier, Jason Kenney, nor our current Premier, Danielle Smith. And I would like to just have you clarify why in 2021, Danielle Smith, our current Premier, was working as a lobbyist for the Alberta Prosperity Project, I believe, in which she lobbied Energy Minister Sonia Savage and Jason Kenney, your government, uh, to put in this liability, take from our royalties, which is our money, because those resources belong to Albertans, mm -hmm. uh, they lobbied in 2021. That's not very long ago. Question. November in October she became our premier and it was in Peter Guthrie's mandate letter that he pursue this. So it, I guess it's fine to say consultations are happening. Who are you consulting now because the budget comes out in two weeks. Is that your question? Yes. Well, again, uh, in terms of the deeper cons consultation, I'll leave that to Minister Peter Guthrie to report on that, but I am grateful that we're actually looking to address this problem. Uh, the reality is that there are abandoned orphan wells across the province, and, uh, you know, I'm not sure what the insinuation is about, you know, the, the Premier in her former days as a lobbyist versus now being Premier. Uh, people run for office because they have issues that they want to address in government. Uh, I'm no different. Uh, whether I was a registered lobbyist pr prior to that or not, I, I wasn't. I, I, I ran a small business. But um, I don't think that that's uh, a negative that someone worked in, in, uh, in government relations prior to running for office. Um, but in terms of mentioning them in my speech, I, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking about the budget. So I, I'm not quite sure, um, you know, what the nature of, of, of the question was other than, uh, but um, I'm, I'm grateful for it. And like I said, no decisions have been made on, on that R-STAR program. And, there's, uh, and when more comes out, then I'll have more to report to you. Talk about one more. Talk about one more. There you go. Okay. okay. I can, I can take this question, obviously, but that, yeah. This will be the last question, as our speaker will have to leave. It's only one or two. I know, I, I do have an appointment, but I'm going to get to it. So okay. Okay. Leona Jacobs, again. So, Leona Jacobs, again. Yes, good to Write that down. <laughs> um, so, you mentioned that your government has thrown some money at food banks. And that's a good move. I don't dispute that at all. However, food banks are a symptom of a bigger problem. So my question has to do with what you're dealing, what, what the plan is, is to deal with the bigger problem of what used to be a distribution of wealth that had maybe outliers at either end, but was a normal kind of distribution curve, to now it looks like a bimodal curve, where you have very wealthy, very not wealthy, and a very thin middle class. So what are you doing to kind of rebuild that normal distribution of wealth so that we actually don't have to rely so heavily on food banks? Thank you for the question. Um, I probably wouldn't characterize it as just throwing money at food banks. Uh, I think that'd be a, a probably inappropriate way of describing it. Uh, but, but what I would say is that in order to 
help people, I think a part of it is letting them keep more of their own money. So we have introduced a number of incentive, uh, a number of programs like the fuel tax relief program, uh, the electricity utility re rebate programs, and other programs like that. Uh, also, um, we've incent we have indexed the, the tax rate so that people can keep more money in their own pockets. Uh, the reality is that I think people know how to spend their own money better than the government does. And I think that's part of this is allowing people to be, to be stewards of their own money instead of, uh, instead of the government. So uh, I appreciate the question, but in this time of need, especially in this time of need, the government is stepping in and giving relief payments to seniors, people with disabilities, and parents with children under 18 to ensure that in these difficult times, they're able to help make ends meet. That's really important. Um, but also, we're helping people keep more of their own money, or allow, you know, letting people keep more of their money by uh, tax, uh, by in indexing the tax, the tax bracket, as well as the fuel tax rebate and uh, utility rebate incentive program. So, Joseph, we usually ask our speakers if they have a take-home message for the audience. Mm -hmm. Do you have something that you would like the audience to think about? Yeah, I uh, was asked this question actually by the media earlier, and the take home message is this. Budget 2023 is another step towards the province being good stewards of your money. As seniors in this stage in your life, you have helped build this province, and you have left a legacy, and as a government, it is our job to respect that legacy and continue on by, uh, by being responsible stewards of the public purse of your money. And so the message I'd like to leave with you today is thank you. Thank you for all you've done to help build this province. Thank you for what you've done to, to raise families. And uh, know that your children and your grandchildren and their resources and their money is being respected by this government. I take that as MLA for Carston Siksika very seriously. And so I'm grateful for, uh, for this time to be with you today, for all your service and all your hard work. And uh, know that, that, uh, that I, I approach this job, with a t this job with a tremendous amount of respect for those who came before me. Okay, thank you to Joseph Scow, MLA for Cards and Siksika for coming here and being with us today. And we'll see you next week. Thank you very much.